Today's talk is uh, about some of the work I've done trying to think a bit more about how we train possession value models, basically. I wrote up a version of this internally for Statspom people, um, and Scott advised me to write it up, and this was his message. So um, I think it, you're, you're those 50 or so people. Um, sadly, you don't have the opportunity to close the tab or whatever, but um, yeah, just a heads up that it's, it's probably a bit dry, a bit theoretical, but um, hopefully there's useful stuff that comes out of it and uh, makes you think a little bit more about how, how we train possession value models. Um, I think there's kind of a, a standard way of doing it in a sense at the moment, um, and I think it, there are some issues that arise from it. They're not like sort of fatal flaws necessarily, but I think there are things we can maybe do a little bit better. Um, so this, this kicked off when we were kind of looking at building some stuff on top of our current OBV model. Um, so I kind of made this little animation that just increases a 90s threshold to try and figure out when this distribution stabilizes. Um, but I noticed that it's not centered at zero. And I had this thing in my head that it should be. Um, so I thought I'll go off and check why I think that, like see if my intuition is correct there, um, and just poke around a little bit. Um, so this is, I think, the simplest way to explain what I've, what I've come up with is this is like the, the simplest possession value model you can think of, basically, on the left. It's um, just try and predict the next goal, expecting next goal difference given the pitch location. That's it. Um, and then on the right-hand side is like the average action value you would get if you like computed it in the normal way. So you just say, like, this is where the pass ends, this is the value there, and then you subtract, uh, subtract the... Um, the start value of that path. So you, you see like a couple of interesting bits about this, I think. So near, near a team's own goal line, the average action value is like slightly positive. Uh, and you get a similar thing like up round near the, round, round near the corners um, in attacking areas. Uh, so I think the, the thing that I find odd about this is you've kind of got two answers to the same question. So. On the left, my, my picture is saying, the expected not next goal difference when you're near the corner flag is 0.05. But if I then look at everywhere the ball went after it was there and average the values of those states, I get an answer that's about 40% higher than that. But the ball has to go somewhere from there. So those two things are kind of answering the same question, but you get different answers. And I, th I think the reason for this in this case is Basically, when, when the ball gets into the area from a corner, it's going to a place that typically has higher value, but like because it's come from a corner, the value tends to be less. So you kind of overestimate the value of where the ball's gotten from a corner, typically, um, and that's where these differences can arise. Uh, and I think like from a player evaluation perspective, the, the problem with this is that you can do completely average things from those areas where the value is typically positive, and be rewarded for it. And then if you compare, the, compare values to a player who does things in different areas of the pitch, it's not necessarily a fair comparison because one, one player is already an advantage just from, like the, just from this sort of um, difference in what the model's saying in different parts of the pitch. Um, so I'm going like, to introduce a bit of notation, sorry. Um, but yeah, basically I'm calling A the thing we're trying to estimate, the value a player's action. Um, that stands for advantage. Um, I'm calling Q the value after you've performed the action, and V the value before you've performed the action. So this is like the standard um, standard value added by an action thing we use in all possession value models, really. Um, and then the the second definition there is bias um, bias of a statistical estimator. So I'm not going to talk about this necessarily directly, but thing like the the things you need to have in your head are that like when we're when we're trying to estimate a quantity statistically there's like some true underlying value of that quantity that exists but we're not aware of and then we have some data in a model that leads to an estimate uh, which we do know by putting a hat on top of that thing um, and these aren't always going to be the same but on average we'd expect them to be zero um, so just this idea of there being like a true thing we're trying to approximate and then um, an estimate of that that arises from the way we choose to do it. Um, so, only to imagine we're training a possession value model, 
and we set it up like this. So we've got this estimate of V, which is the value before you perform the action, we'll call that V hat. Um, we just get this by building some state features, throwing them into some machine learning algorithm, um, and then we get our estimate of V. And then we do the same thing for, uh, for Q. So this is the, the value after the action's been performed. Um, so as I said, there'll be some error associated with these models. So there'll be, no matter what we do really, there'll, there'll be some difference from the, the true function that we're trying to approximate. I'm going to call these epsilon. Um, and you can plug, plug this into the formula to compute the value added. And you get this relationship between the errors for those individual models. So it's actually um, the error of, the, of your estimate of what happens after the action's been performed minus the error of your estimate of the value before the action's been performed. Um, and this leads to some kind of weird stuff. So um, let's say I'll, I'll go off and I'll train both of these models. Um, and it turns out that my error for both is 0 0.1. So this is like an over prediction of 0 0.1 uh, expected goal difference, which is pretty bad. Like <clears throat> that's quite a lot of expected goals to be over predicting by. Um, but it's the same for both of the models. So then when I estimate my value added by subtracting these two things, those errors cancel out. And my estimate of the advantage is actually perfect. <laughs> um, but if I don't check this, and I just go and um, I just say, like, the performance on these two models looks really bad. I'm just going to go off and try and optimize them separately. Um, I'll come back and I'll check, and it looks like I've done a really good job. I've improved both of these models individually, um, but by different amounts. So now when I subtract those two estimates from each other, I actually end up with a higher error for the thing I care about, which is the value added by the action than I did beforehand. Um, and this is like this is pretty counterintuitive. Like you would expect if you if you improve either of the individual components, then your estimate of the value added would get better. But this is yeah, counterintuitively not the case. Um, and kind of the, the same thing applies if you, if you think about things more in more standard way, where you just have like one model that estimates a value function, um, and then you subtract the value at subsequent states. Like this model can still be better or worse in different parts of the feature space. Um, so it might be near goal, my approximation of the value is a little bit better than um, further away from goal or something like that. And, and then you still end up with this like uh, subtraction of the errors in different parts of the feature space. Um, so this is a uh, this this picture on the bottom here is like on the on the x-axis is the your error in the estimate of the value of the end state, and on the y-axis is the uh, the same for the start state. If if it's green, that means uh, a slight improvement in your start state estimate will make your overall estimate of the advantage better. Um, but there are these red areas where that's not the case. So um, if there's about a quarter of this space where you can improve your estimate of the start state, but make your estimate of the value added uh, worse. Um, so we want to try and avoid this as much as we can, really. Uh, avoid being in those parts of the space. Uh, another way to look at this is the variance of, uh, of your advantage estimate. So I think the key thing to note here on the uh, on the bottom equation there is like there's this correlation term at the end, uh, which is comes with a negative sign. So if you can increase the correlation between the errors of the two component models, without increasing the variance of the individual models too much, then you end up with a better advantage estimate. Um, so a strategy here is like to to try and make the errors of the two models correlate as you can really. Um, so a way to do that that I sort of came up with was you train a model for the value after the action as you normally would. So you have, a, you have whatever possession value target you want to use. Uh, and in that model, you include features about the state and the action that's performed. So in the simplest case, that would just be like the start and end location of the action. Um, but you can obviously add, add other things to it. Um, and then the way you correlate the errors is you remove those features about like the end location or the action that's taken place. And then rather than training the second model on the same possession value target, you train it on the output of that previous model. So that means that like any errors that you built up in the first stage kind of get carried over to the second model. Um, and it's still predicting those, so it correlates the errors a bit more. But the way you're estimating Q is still as you'd normally do it. So you're getting like a reasonable estimate for the, for the first advantage function and then trying to correlate the errors. Um, so 
to, to test if this was doing what I thought it should do, um, I ran this experiment. Um, so the way this works is I just uh, bin all of the actions I've got in my data set uh, according to distance to goal. And then for each of those bins, I build a histogram uh, that contains the possession value added according to my model across all players. Um, and then for each player in my data set, I build like a simulated or resampled possession value added from those distributions. So I'll just say like, okay, a player performed an action here and their actual action value from there was this, but I'm just gonna replace that by sampling from the distribution of action values across all players. Um, so in theory, this should like completely remove any correlation between those two things. Um, because we kind of, if, if, if these two things are correlated, your possession value is being driven by like where and how often you get the ball, really. Um, and you could sort of do anything that any player would do from those places and still accrue a similar possession value. Um, I think this is not what we're trying to estimate with these models. Um, so, yeah, I, I ran this. Um, so for, the, for this new approach I've suggested on the left, um, that correlation basically goes away. Uh, so this is, this is like much less driven by where and how often you get in the ball. Um, and for our OBV model that we have at the moment, this correlation is like pretty high. Um, so this is not to say that that model is not useful or, um, or anything like that. It's, it's just it has this particular property that is like, the values it gives to players are kind of quite heavily driven by where and how often they get the ball, um, which, yeah, is, I suppose, if, if, if you're used to that being a behavior of the model, then it's fine. Um, but it's just a thing to be aware of, I think. Um, and yeah, to, I sort of checked this with, against other, other sort of standard ways you could estimate possession value. Um, and you see, you see a similar correlation. I think this is because they're, they're estimating the action values in, in the same way, basically. Um, so on the left is just that, that dead simple model I, I showed at the start, which has really high correlation. Um, and then uh, vape and expected threat that penalizes turnovers as well. Um, in both of those cases, you get like uh, a reasonably strong positive correlation between those two things. Um, so yeah, one, one final thing I'll talk about that I looked at was um, like the, the season to season auto correlation of these things on, on a player level. So ideally for a metric, you want it to be um, consistent between a player's uh, half seasons in this case. So I'm just splitting up um, all of the stuff a player did into two halves of a season and then computing their action value added uh, across both of those halves. So this new approach comes out with um, quite a bit lower correlation um, between those halves of seasons than, than the existing OBV model. Uh, so I was like, I wonder, wonder what's going on here. Um, I think because OBV is driven heavily by where you receive the ball and how often, um, if, though, if those two things are really consistent season to season, then that would sort of feed into this correlation a little bit. Um, and it, it turns out that I, th I think that is what's happening. So, um, yeah, on, on the right here, this is just the, the same thing, but for only the, only the start value, so the value of where you receive the ball. Um, and that thing has super high correlation uh, season to season. That doesn't change very much. Um, so I think that's kind of partly driving this, this high auto correlation for, for OBV. Um, so, yes, that's about all I've got on that. I just want to give a give a shout to some recent stuff that's kind of also trying to, I think, challenge some of the existing ways we have to do stuff, um, which I think, I think is always a worthwhile thing to do, like however incremental the, um, the improvements are, I think it's always worth like trying to think about how things work and if we can improve them. Uh, so this, this first paper I've suggested is uh, about a similar thing, but in American football, um, and points out lots of uh, lots of like transferable issues that we have in possession value models. Um, and the second one is um, about skill metrics and from XG in particular, and how, how we go about estimating XG models and whether we can do that a little bit a little bit better. Um, so yeah, I, th I think all, all this sort of line of work is um, is something I'm really interested in. I hope other people are.